Thank you all for being here. I, this this has been great. It's about an hour and a half to get up here and uh, well worth the trip. Not just for you, but Brewster's as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> stopped in there and got my raspberry chocolate chip truffle ice cream. So that was good. Um, and I've got a wedding at 530, so we're going to see if we can make it back. Uh, thank, thank you for being here. Uh, like that introduction, that was way more information than you wanted. Um, I did not grow up in the church, so I, my mother and grandfather raised me Catholic, and uh, I was all in. I was president of the Catholic Youth Organization for two years as a youth. Um, my priest and I were very close, uh, so much so that I wanted to be a priest. I was kind of headed towards the priesthood. That's what I thought my life's ambition was at 14, 15 years old. Um, some things <coughs> happened that I believe are God-directed, but um, uh, I started noticing girls. That was one thing. Got the priest gave me married. Um, so that was one thing. The other thing was my home life was not great. I came from a broken home. My mother and father were fighting a lot. I spent a lot of time with my grandfather, who was my hero. Um, he was a, uh, just a solid, solid guy. He made sure that I went to Mass every time uh, that there was a possibility to go. However, my grandfather was also very reasonable, very logical about things. And uh, I remember coming home one day from school, it was during Lent, and during Lent, as Catholics, we didn't eat meat on Friday, but there was a loophole, you could eat white meat, you could eat fish, right? And so I came home one Friday and I hadn't had lunch, and he said, why didn't you eat lunch? And I said, because they didn't have any other options but burgers, and he said, well, eat a burger. I mean, God's not going to condemn you for that. You know, so that was kind of my grandfather. Um, my parents divorced when I was 16, my dad sat me down and said that he was going to leave and you know, wanted me to take care of my mother and uh, no 16 year old should have big charge with taking care of his mother but uh, my mother was uh, had her challenges many challenges she passed away in 2014 from some of those challenges um, and my dad and I are very close now he was baptized in 2017 by the way that was awesome um, but uh, so I was on my way to the priesthood and then you know my parents are having problems my priest gets arrested uh, and so he's taken out of my life and so here I am um, trying to figure things out at 17, 18 years old, and uh, I just fell away. I didn't go anywhere for a long time. I would, you know, visit certain churches, and I was, you know, kind of traveling down every road you could imagine, not probably knowing what I was looking for or if, if I found it, what it was. Um, and then I met my wife, Libby, and uh, she had uh, attended Seventh and Muller Church of Christ in Paraguay, Arkansas. Seventh and Muller Church of Christ. I knew a lot of people there, but I, I was not going to go to the Church of Christ. Of all the places that I had gone and visited, I wouldn't go there. We uh, used to have a thing at the Catholic Church called Soup and a Sermon, where we'd invite different preachers to come in and preach uh, a lesson while we had lunch, and the Church of Christ preacher would never come. And so in my mind, they were elitist. I didn't want anything to do with us. I don't want anything to do with you. But as only a pretty girl can do, my <laughs> wife persuaded me and I went to church with her one Sunday, and the youth minister was preaching that Sunday, Willie Sandlin. And Willie Sandlin preached a lesson that, I don't know, it just kind of hit me between the eyes. I also realized that everybody there, just about, I knew, not only that, they lived around me. And a lot of these people had invited me over for supper and things like that. Of course, now I realize what they were doing. They were trying to take care of me because they knew my situation and also tried to live out the gospel. And... Uh, so in 1997, my wife and I moved to Charlotte, Arkansas. I just bought a house in Charlotte, Tennessee, which is kind of cool. But uh, moved to Charlotte, Arkansas. I was the head basketball and baseball coach there at 24 years of age. So I was six years older than the seniors. Uh, I wore a baseball uniform to coach baseball. And the, coach, uh, the umpires always thought I was one of the kids. But anyway, uh, I get up there. My superintendent is, uh, is an elder in the Charlotte Church of Christ, Church of 40, 50 people. Ralph Wallace was a preacher. He split time with Chuck Crow, who was a counselor at the nearby school. And uh, I asked Ralph Wallace to come over to the house. I had a lot of questions for him. And uh, I began firing at him. What does Church of Christ doctrine say about this? What does Church of Christ doctrine say about that? And finally, Ralph stopped me. He was in his 80s. He stopped me and he said, Chris, I don't have Church of Christ doctrine. I have a Bible. And that's, that's all you need. And I thought, you know, that makes sense. At least in theory, that made sense to me. Now, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of different interpretations a lot of different people have about the Bible. But to just follow the Word of God made a lot of sense to me. And so in October of 1997, 
I was baptized, became a Christian, and um, about four years into this coaching gig, five years into it, a friend of mine uh, that I worked with, her husband was a deacon over the youth at North Heights in Batesville, which was the big town close to Charlotte. And the uh, church there was about 350, and, and James asked me, he said, you don't know of anybody that want to be a youth minister, do you? We're looking. And I said, well, what about me? Well, he loved the idea, but this was 1999. I was baptized in 1997. I knew about this much. And uh, so we went through a whole process, about two months long, and finally the elder said, you know, we love the idea of a coach doing this youth work, and we think you would be the right guy, but you don't know anything. And I said, that's true. He said, we're going to send you back to school. So we'll pay for you to take two classes a semester at Harding. We'll pay for your gas to drive down there and back, and we'll buy your books. I said, okay, let's do it. And so that started a journey that after four years, um, the preacher, Steve Norris, came to me and he said, Chris, you know, this youth thing is that's great. You need to preach. I said, okay. Well, my wife was driving back and forth from Jonesboro, Arkansas, where she was teaching. We lived in Batesville, to Fayetteville, Arkansas, one night a week, which was five hours. She would get home at two in the morning and get up the next morning and drive to Jonesboro, which was an hour. As, you know, God would have it in my plans. We end up in Cassville, Missouri, which was 60 miles from Fayetteville. She drove back and forth and finished her doctorate while I preached there. And then we ended up in uh, Abilene, Texas, where she's been at ACU. And I've been preaching at Old Lane for 14 years until November. We moved uh, to Dixon, Tennessee. It's been a great move, closer to family and all that. So that's kind of my story. Um, I tell you that to say that from personal experience, and you can agree or disagree with me, from personal experience, what I found that I needed in the church was relationship. You know, let, let's just set aside for a minute authority of Scripture, um, you know, a church that, that stands on truth and all that. We're going to take that as a given, right? Outside of that, what is it that you need from the church? I, I think it's relationship, right? And believe it or not, I don't believe that it starts with relationships with each other. I'll get into that more in a second. Reminds me of a story. There was a family that went to the movies. And they walked in the theater, and the little boy says, I want some popcorn. And so the dad gives him some uh, money for popcorn, so we're going to go ahead and get our seats. And it took a little longer than normal for the boy to get his popcorn. So he finally gets in, he walks in, but the theater is dark. They've already started the movie. And so he's walking up and down the dimly lit aisles trying to find his parents. He doesn't see him anywhere, and he's getting desperate. He's frantic. And so eventually he just goes to the front of the theater and stands up and he says, does anybody here recognize me? <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that walk into our churches every Sunday morning feeling like that little boy. Isolated, disconnected, you know, asking themselves, does anyone here recognize me? Um, I, I think the church can resemble a movie theater sometimes. You know, you file in, you sit next to somebody you don't know, you stare straight ahead and file out and nothing ever really changes. Remember this little exercise? This is the church, this is the steeple, open it up and see all the people. Not really accurate, is it? Really, it should probably go like this. This is the church building. This is the steeple on the church building. Open it up and see the church. But that's not quite as catchy, right? But unless and until we as Christians understand that church is not a building or a place that you go to three times a week and agreed upon time unless and until we understand that the church is about people and not brick and mortar until we comprehend that we're never going to change who we are and what we're about we always talk about being the first century church folks the first century church was a movement we're not a movement if we want to get back to being what they were and doing what they did we've got to move I'm afraid that in many places the church is more of a monument mm -hmm. to a once great movement. Have you ever noticed that old country churches have a cemetery next to them? How appropriate that is anymore, right? It's like a monument to a once great movement. If we want to be what they were, we've got to do what they did, which is move. A word that is often associated with church and relationships is fellowship. You know what fellowship is, right? Latin for potluck. Right? <laughs> Not exactly. It's commonly what we think of when we hear the word fellowship. We think of casseroles and card games and 
maybe gossip, and while fellowship can certainly include food and conversation and fun, it's important for us to understand that fellowship is something you have. It's not something you do. You know, fellowship is one of those things that cannot be stressed enough because it's about identity. When I was younger, I had a friend named Jamie, and uh, Jamie was a rebel with the cause. His cause was to follow as few rules as possible. And uh, he was the kind of kid that only a mother could love, um, probably needed the sense beat into him or something beat out of him. And my, my mother would have obliged. I mean, uh, if it wasn't for the whole CPS and jail time, she would have been glad to do it. My mother did not like this young man. My dad neither. And uh, on the rare occasions that she would let me hang out with Jamie, she always asked some questions. You know, where are you going? Who else is going to be there? What time will you be home? All that kind of stuff. And it never failed that when I came home, after a couple of days, she would say something like, I can always tell when you've been hanging around so-and-so. Because apparently his personality would rub off on me. And I, I think it brings to light something that we all know is that our relationships, to some degree, define us, right? I mean, it's an undeniable truth that our relationships tell something about who we are, where we've been, where we are and where we're going, what's expected of us. Our associations say something about us. One night, he decided it'd be a good idea to throw some eggs at cars, and so uh, he did that, and we got chased and caught, and I got in trouble. I didn't throw an egg. I didn't want to throw eggs, but you ever heard of guilt by association? Yeah, that was what I was a victim of that night. Relationships define us, and they probably matter more than we would like to admit. Fellowship is defined by relationship. We are relational beings. God made us that way, which makes perfect sense because God is a relational God. And the Bible speaks of fellowship as a two-dimensional affair. It is vertical and it is horizontal. And the vertical provides the formatting for the horizontal, meaning that the vertical provides the organization, the configuration, and the layout for the horizontal. And John stresses this very well in 1 John chapter 4 beginning in verse 11. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that... Am I keeping it up here? No? Yeah. Okay. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we have, may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So the horizontal plane presupposes the vertical for its very existence. We are who are his body, we are predicated upon our connection to the head. Does that make sense? The vertical informs the horizontal. There has to be a vertical before there can be a horizontal. Again, 1 John chapter 1 this time. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was revealed, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was revealed to us. I'm sorry, I did 16.9, and this is obviously not the format, so we've got a little bit mess up here. What we have seen and heard and proclaimed to you also, so that you, too, um, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. I don't even know if this is a word, but it sounds pretty good, I guess. It's tweetable, right? Fellowship begins with fellowship. You are defined by your relationship with God, and that relationship 
defines all other relationships in your life. If you get God right, you get everything else right. Many of you have a priority list. When I was coaching, it was faith, family, football, basketball, whatever the sport was. Whatever your priority list is, it's probably something similar, God, family, career, whatever. Now, you may not always keep those priorities in order, but that's your priority list. Theoretically, that's the way you want to live your life, right? I suggest to you that list is too long. I think your priority list should read, number one, God, and number two, there is no number two. Get God right and allow that to trickle down in every other aspect of your life, especially your relationships. I told my daughters, find you a guy that loves God more than they love you. I really feel like that no one suffers in a family when husband and wife love God more. Because you love God others best when you love God the most, right? Mm -hmm. So the horizontal plane presupposes the vertical for its very existence. Now what this means is that if you attend church with someone that you're not particularly fond of, and maybe you have beef with, maybe you're bitter, maybe you're harboring resentment, then you need to do something about that. And you don't do something about that by going to that person. First and foremost, you go to God. Mm -hmm. Because if you are harboring bitterness, if there is anger and resentment and malice in you, then it's a sign that your relationship with God is not what it needs to be. Forget the other person for a second. That's got to be fixed as well. But first and foremost, you fix things with, with God. Because you can't be right with God and not be right with your fellow man. Don't fool yourself into believing that the vertical can be straight while the horizontal is crooked. Because it just doesn't work that way. Matthew chapter 5 says, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. So the implication is clear. If you want to be right with God, then you've got to be right with your fellow man. And in fact, that is so important that it comes before what? Worship. Yeah. yeah. Don't be coming in here thinking you can worship God correctly when you have beef with your brother or sister. You need to go get that fixed first and then come and worship me. John said it this way. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and yet he hates his brother or sister he is a liar for the one who does not love his brother and sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen and this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God must love his brother and sister this is the two greatest commandments just worded a little differently isn't it? Mm -hmm. love the Lord your God with all of your heart soul mind and strength love your neighbor as yourself it's 2d discipleship it's vertical and it's horizontal it's relational living. It's called being a Jesus follower. You're connected to God, to the head, first and foremost. And then that connection informs all of your other connections. Or you could look at it like this. You've got a cross, all right? The up and down, the vertical represents your relationship with God, right? And the horizontal represents your relationship with other people. But right here in the middle, right here in the center where these two intersect, that's where life is lived, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. The, the basis of Christianity in a nutshell is love God, love your neighbor. That's it. Now, there's a lot more, right? you got to fill in some gaps there. But basically, that is Christ following 101. The vertical, the horizontal intersect, and life is lived right there in the center where the two come together. This isn't about casseroles. And thank goodness, because I don't like casseroles. Which, coming into the church, that was, that was kind of a problem. I mean, people were wondering if they should accept me. <laughs> Fellowship is about something way deeper than coffee and, and donuts and conversation. It's about fellowship. It's about letting the up and down determine the left and the right. In short, it's about loving what God loves. Let me introduce you to someone. You know who that is? So that's Coach K. And the reason he's called Coach K is because his last name has like 10 consonants in a row. Um, in fact, spell check was going nuts when I typed out Shashevsky in my notes. But uh, as a former coach, there were certain coaches that I watched on a regular basis to get uh, ideas from. And some of them were not coaches that I particularly liked personally. But like Bobby Knight, I didn't really care for his character, but I learned a lot from Bobby Knight. And Coach Gay was one I learned a lot from. I remember coaching in little rural Charlotte, Arkansas, watching Duke play basketball, watching film, and seeing something I liked. And I thought, man, I'd like to have that. So I called him. I called Duke's office. And the lady answered, and I knew that this wouldn't go anywhere, but I said, yeah, I'm an 
Arkansas high school basketball coach, I'd like to talk to Coach K about something. She goes, well, he's not in right now. He's in practice. You'd like to leave a message. I said, sure. I left a message. He didn't call me back, but one of his assistants, in fact, the guy that's now the coach, uh, called. And uh, he said, well, I can send you some stuff. Now, they're not going to give away all their secrets, you know. But they, they were so good to me in sending me a lot of different stuff that I could use. Of course, it's to their benefit to have good relationships with high school coaches because they never know. They're not going to get a kid out of Charlotte, Arkansas, but they might get somebody someday that I'm coaching. So anyway, Coach K, whether you like him or not, five national championships, 12 Final Fours. He just retired last year. He's considered to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, basketball coaches of all time, not just in college, overall. Before the 2015 NCAA March Madness Tournament, he gave every one of his players a basketball and a Sharpie. And he said, I want you to write on that basketball the names of every person that has helped you get to where you are today. So your bus drivers, your teachers, guidance counselors, parents, anybody that has helped you make it to this point in life, I want you to write their names on that basketball and I want you to carry that basketball with you wherever you go. Because I want it to be a constant reminder of how you got here. Well, they won the national championship in 2015, and I don't know that he realized it, but it makes a really good spiritual point. None of you got here without the help of somebody. Very few people pick up a Bible and read it and go, you know what, I need to be baptized and be a member of the church. Christians become Christians because of other Christians most of the time, right? Converted sinners make the best preachers, don't they? Christians become Christians because of other Christians. I, I could give you a Bible, you know, and say, here's a Sharpie, write on it, everybody who's helped you get to this point. And my guess is there would be more than a couple of names that you would write down. It takes all of us working together because if a team is defined by a collection of individuals united in a common bond and a common goal, then that's what the church is, isn't it? And what's our common goal? To win, right? I want to win, don't you? And like I said Thursday night, I've looked at the back, back of the Bible, and guess what? We do win. I mean, that's, that's the message. We win. Revelation that's so daunting and so scary, actually it's got a great message. And the message is we win. We overcome. We make it. And so if we want to win, it's going to take all of us because, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we're all limping disciples. We all need hope. We all need help. And we all need strength. And if we're going to do this, we've got to do it together. Look with me at Philippians chapter 1. Now, you can call it teamwork, you can call it synergy, you can call it whatever you want. Paul called it fellowship. And notice what is written. I thank God, uh, my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers <coughs> of grace with me. So Philippians is really an essay on fellowship. If you've read through Philippians, you know that. Paul uses the word koinonia a lot, the Greek word for fellowship, and it can mean um, communion or sharing or association or participation. But Paul here emphasizes an aspect of fellowship that I don't think we always think about. He emphasizes the aspect of partnership because that's what this is. When you become a Christian, when you are immersed in the waters of baptism and you come up out of those waters a new creature in Christ, in essence, you're saying, God, I'm partnering with you. I'm partnering with you and I'm partnering with your people to further the gospel, to be about mission and to be about you and to live at the center of your will. Paul emphasizes partnership because for him, fellowship with the Philippian brethren was all about co-partnering with the gospel. They partnered with him financially through prayer. There were those who labored with him in the mission field, fellow workers as he referred to them, people like Timothy and Epaphroditus. So Paul's not emphasizing potlucks. He's emphasizing partnership. And do you know what this all means? It's really encouraging because what it means is Every time you, you give money to the church, when you contribute financially in the offering on Sunday morning when they, I don't know if they pass the plates anymore, but when you contribute financially, you're partnering with the church here and the things that it is doing in this community and beyond. When you 
contribute financially to you know a, a missionary in, in Ecuador or you know Africa or the remotest parts of the earth you're laboring with them when you pray for your elders for the preachers you are partnering with this church and with them in the spreading of the gospel and the mission that they are trying to carry out. Some are able to go to, to Africa or Siberia or, or really remote parts of the earth. Some are able to contribute millions of dollars to build a, a preaching school or, a, or an orphanage. And, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I certainly don't want to diminish that, but many of us can't do that, right? But we can all do something. And all of it counts. All of it is important. We can pray. We can give of our time and our energy. We have to do something because fellowship equals partnership. You weren't saved to sit. You weren't saved to sour. You weren't saved to soak. You were saved to serve. But Paul emphasizes some other, emphasizes some other types of fellowship. Notice chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement of Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. So God's people have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Our participation in the Spirit, as he says, is the basis for our oneness. We are to be of one mind and one heart as people united in one spirit. The Spirit of God was partnering with the church in Philippi to make them into the people he wanted them to be. And the Spirit is at work in our lives with the intent that we shine our lights and bring glory to God. Or as verse 13 states it, for it is God who is at work in you both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. So, not only do we partner with God, not only do we partner with Jesus in the Great Commission, we also partner with the Spirit as we maintain a united front and we focus on the things that make us better servants. But Paul talks about another kind of fellowship here I think it's kind of interesting. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them mere rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. Don't run past that. Being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The fellowship of his sufferings. You think about the magnitude of that statement. Paul viewed his suffering as a way to draw closer to Jesus. The result of his trials and tribulations was a deeper relationship with the Lord. And when the people of Philippi sent Paul a gift while he was in prison, they were sharing in his trouble, right? They were participating in his suffering. They were partnering with him in his mission as they sacrificed of their own means to try and lift his burden. Remember when Jesus prayed for fellowship? It's John chapter 20. Have it here. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I and them, and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. Why would Jesus feel the need to pray for unity? And what would that answer look like? What would the answer to that prayer look like? He says it so that the world may believe that you sent me. That's it. That's the, that's the primary purpose for unity and fellowship and, and partnership. Unity is a huge draw because our world is so disjointed. I'm sure you've noticed this, right? That there's so much conflict. There's so much uh, animus. And you, know, you can get on Twitter and it's like a bathroom wall. I mean, all Twitter is is you're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. That back and forth all the time. You look in the world around us, there's racial division. There's division on campuses of colleges and universities. There's, there's division in politics. I mean, everywhere you turn, people don't need a soap opera when they come to church. They've got enough of that in their lives. So when they come to worship, when they come to get together with fellow Christians, 
They should enjoy something way different than what the world has to offer. And when other people see that, it's a draw. I mean, people are dealing with so much in their daily lives and then they see us as a people united in a common bond, striving for a common goal, and they're attracted to it. Not everybody, but many are. They're thinking, you know, I want what that person has. I want to be a part of that. I've got so much dysfunction and disjointedness in my life. I, I want to go somewhere where people get along and they love each other and they, they show it, right? We have the wonderful opportunity to give people a front row seat to the grace of God. It's a beautiful thing. To show people that we are partnering for something that is bigger than ourselves. Am I on the right track? I mean, is that kind of what you guys have experienced? I just know me personally coming into the church, what I needed more than anything was relationship. And as a preacher, I feel an awesome responsibility to every week give people hope. Yeah, I feel like that it's my responsibility that when the people leave on Sunday, that they don't just have more information, but that I have hopefully incited transformation. It's not my goal to give them a lecture or stand up and give a book report every week. That's not what I'm there to do. My goal or my job is not to just disseminate information. My goal is to incite transformation. I tell people all the time, I'm, I'm a climatologist. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to set a climate for growth. I can't make you grow, you know? But I'm trying to set a climate for, for you to grow. I want you to leave with hope. Even if the preacher has to rebuke, get up in your kitchen a little bit, right? You still should leave with hope. Because as long as you can draw breath, you've got hope. One of the things that I've done in the six months I've been away from my wife. Have I said how miserable that is enough? Uh, one of the things I've done is Coach Parker, the Dixon County High School baseball coach, has said, uh, hey, you just coach baseball. I said, yeah, he goes, rather than sitting at home crying all the time that your wife's not there, why don't you come help with baseball? So I've been coaching baseball for the last several months, and it's been great. Kids are great. It's a great way to get involved in the community. But one thing Coach Parker always says, he just beat cancer. He's 53 years, old, 53 years old, just beat cancer, and he tells the boys every day, he said, man, it's a great day to play baseball. He said, you're vertical and you're ventilating. And that's always good, and I, I love that. And I want people to leave our worship service feeling like, you know what? I may be down and out. I may have gotten scolded a little bit. I may have, you know, that preacher may have stepped on my toes or my heart, but there's hope. Every preacher should answer the question, so what? Right? Every sermon should answer that question. At the end of it, okay, I hear what you're saying, preacher. I need this. I should do this. Whatever it is. So what? How do I? What's the application? How do I do better at this? So what's the application for this? What's the so what? Well, it's not just about what you need from the church. It's about what you can contribute to the church as well. Because I'm afraid that all too often we come into the church with a checklist of things, and if the church doesn't meet that checklist, whatever it is, we're out the door. Now, some of the items on that checklist are very important, and you should leave if they don't meet those. If they don't respect authority of Scripture, you need to be out the door. You know? But a lot of the things that I've noticed in my time as a minister, my short time as a minister, is a lot of the things are consumeristic. And, and I don't see too many people entering into the church saying, what can I do to make this place better? How can I contribute here? Can I partner with this group of people to make this church the best that it can be? You know, there's a humbleness that has to go along with them, right? So it's not just about what you need. It's what you can do to meet the needs of the church. Politics drives me nuts. I don't talk about politics much because it drives me bonkers. But I have seen Christians that will accept mediocrity in politics and they'll vote for a candidate as long as he agrees with them on one issue. He may be scum of the earth in every other area of his life, but as long as he agrees with me on one issue, but not the church, it's got to be perfect in every way or else I'm out the door. It drives me crazy. Folks, if you find the perfect church, don't go there. You'll run it. <laughs> because there is no perfect church. You know why? Because there's people. And people are problematic. They just are. But how can we make it better? Can we be a part of the solution? Or part of the problem? And so I would suggest to you, in order to partner with the church, ask the question, what can I do? How can I get involved? How can I help? 
how can I make this church the best it can be? And instead of always expecting people to come and to cater to you, take off the bib, put on an apron, and get ready to go to work. Right? At some point you've got to do that. You are responsible for your own feeding and for your own growth and development. As the preacher, I can be like the mom bird and chew up the food and drop it in your mouth for a while, but eventually you're going to have to learn to fly on your own and feed yourself. At some point you've got to learn to be a self-feeder and grow and mature. If you're only getting nourishment twice a week at church, it's not enough. Because I don't know about you, I eat every day. More than once a day. So at some point you've got to take ownership in this and take the lead on this, right? I want you to go back to the Garden of Eden as we finish up here. Genesis 2, verse 5. Now no shrub of the field was yet on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Let's get down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and tend it. We often think of work as like a four-letter word. But God worked, and God created man to work. Work intensified after the fall, but before the fall, work was not a curse. Work was a part of the daily routine for Adam and then Eve. And so God tells Adam and Eve to, you know, cultivate this, make it great for subsequent generations. Don't mess it up, right? And what did they do? Well, they messed it up, right? I bring all this up to make the point that God has always partnered with people. That has always been what he wanted, to partner with people. It was Adam and Eve, it was Moses, it was Noah, it was David. I mean, you can go down the list, right? He has always partnered with people. And it's no different today. God wants to partner with his people. Why? I mean, surely he knows that's a bad idea. Surely he knows that his people are going to let him down, that they are going to turn their backs on him, that they're going to sin. But God has always wanted a special relationship with his people. And do you know what we call that? We call it a covenant. Now, covenants can be man-made. Those are bilateral covenants. But the covenant we're talking about is a God-made covenant, which is unilateral, meaning God sets the terms and conditions, and we have no other obligation but to meet the terms and conditions or at our own peril turn away. Right? God has partnered with you. And so the question becomes, what are you doing to partner with God? He's always wanted a special relationship with His people. He's given us a garden. So what are we going to do with it? Another coach. May know who that is? Oh, I got the name up there. So you didn't know it. <laughs> Many people believe this is the greatest coach in basketball history. John Wood. He always said that a man who puts the ball through the hoop has ten hands. Absolutely true. As a former basketball coach, I can tell you that is absolutely true. If you have one kid that's putting the ball through the basket more times than anyone else, you're probably not going to win much. We're a team. And if we're going to win, it's going to take all of us, all of our hands. Questions? Comments? This looks like a good group. <laughs> It's a bunch of young people in this room. Please understand me when I say this. You're not the future of the church, okay? You're the church. You are the church right now. So go change the world, okay? Let's pray. Most kind and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for these people, for this church, for this seminar, for everything that you have done for us and will do for us in the future. God, may we partner with you and be your hands and feet in this world. And may we serve you to the best of our ability. And may we seek to be the best for you that we can possibly be. We love you. And it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.